à ceux qui n'en ont pas. My, my name is Karee Peterson Smith, and I am the Michael Ratner Middle East Fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies. Uh, and I am so excited to welcome you today for a very special conversation with Harsha Walia about dismantling borders. Uh, I am coming to you from this place called Boston on Massachusetts and Wampanoag land. And the IPS office is located in this place called Washington DC on Piscataway land. And every day, but especially today, uh, when we are talking about borders, the myriad forms of violence they advance and undoing them, I want to express my commitment and IPS's commitment to solidarity with the ongoing indigenous uh, struggles for self-determination throughout the Americas and around the world. I want to say that we know that the stories and the histories of indigenous peoples, including the migrations of indigenous peoples, well predate the borders drawn across this earth and the struggles for native sovereignty must be priorities for all of us. Both because those struggles uh, and self-determination, th these are, this is a right of indigenous peoples and also because all of us, including those of us who are not indigenous, gain so much from these amazing indigenous struggles like the ones against uh, line three in the Keystone XL pipelines uh, and, and so on. Uh, they are making the planet more livable for all of us. And that includes indigenous resistance to borders, something that we will talk a bunch about tonight, I believe. This conversation on dismantling borders is the last in a series that we've had at IPS called Displacement, Migration, Borders, and Resistance. Um, and this series has gone on throughout October. We have discussed the displacement of Haitian folks, Afghans, Palestinians, and people displaced by climate change everywhere. We have discussed the resistance of Black and Indigenous Garifuna people with Ofrene, the Black Fraternal Organization of Honduras. And we have discussed border and migration policy under the pres president, current President Biden um, in the United States. You can find videos of the other events on the IPS YouTube channel, and you can check out future events at our events page at ips-dc.org slash events. Now, I will um, actually share that the idea for this entire series really emerged out of a conversation that Harsha and I had um, after the publishing of her incredible book, Border and Rule, uh, and how we wanted to do an event together. And while there are so many possible um, injustices related to borders and migration policies, that she so discurly discusses in Border and Rule. We really wanted an event where we were not just talking about the problems with borders, but the solutions in the form of dismantling borders. Um, and so I have been incredibly grateful throughout this series to explore the injustices that I named in uh, their specific contexts, you know, the incredible level of violence that Haitian folks are experiencing uh, right now and experienced. Just a few weeks ago at the US-Mexico border, the you know, desperation that we saw in Afghanistan as people were uh, displaced uh, and, and, and seeking refuge elsewhere um, and so on. It was so important in the series to be talking about these horrendous injustices. In each of those um, conversations, I should say, involved envisioning solutions and involved resistance as well. Um, but I am especially incredibly excited to talk about the problem of borders themselves uh, tonight um, and about dismantling them. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll say that um, I've been very grateful to be writing much more about uh, the idea of getting rid of borders um, and, and opening and, and dismantling and ending borders. And as I have, there are people who say, this sounds amazing. The idea of a world without border, it's about literally, what does that mean? How, how can we have that? How do we get there? And that is exactly what we want to talk about tonight. Um, and I can think of no person I'd rather discuss these things with than Harsha Walia, who is a scholar of borders and undoing them. She is the author of Undoing Border Imperialism by AK Press, which I keep right here on my desk <laughs> all the time, as well as the more recent Border and Rule uh, by Haymarket Books. Um, she is a leading voice for border abolition. Um, and I wanna say just by way of framing 
that today uh, we see, of course, a world which, in which borders not only respond to the displacement of millions of people, but borders themselves displace people. Um, and they keep people where they are. You know, I think about undocumented folks in this country who can't leave because of, of borders uh, as well. And so borders are not just a secondary injustice, but a driver of injustice. And yet today, as we look around, we also see this amazing, inspiring resistance to borders um, that I hope we talk about tonight. I'll, I'll just put one thing on the table again by way of framing. You know, earlier this year in May, um, there was the kind of latest episode of Israeli violence in Palestine. Um, and amid these examples of horrendous Israeli violence, we also saw this amazing Palestinian resistance, including the mobilization of Palestinians across Palestine, but also in Jordan and in Lebanon to the border um, and confronting the, the borders that Israel has imposed. And these were not just Palestinians who were extending solidarity with those Palestinians in Jerusalem and in Gaza who are under attack, but these were refugees who were returning home, right? And so, you know, there are real living examples in the world today that are about confronting borders. And uh, I hope that we can get into all of that. So welcome, uh, Harsha, so good to see you. So um, good to see you too. Yeah, so excited. And I, I just wonder if you could start us off. I'm going to start with like a really big, you know, <laughs> invitation to just um, give us in a, in a, however you want to, the case against borders. Why, why should we fight not oppose, not only against these particular injustices, but against borders themselves? Sure. Thank you. Um, let me just first say thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited for this conversation. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Um, and I'm so excited to be in conversation with you. I'm just learned so much and I'm indebted to your work. Um, and just, you know, constantly reading things that you write and all the good work that you do. So I am so excited and honored to be in conversation with you. Um, and also, I want to say that I'm on the unceded, unsurrendered territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish nations. And similarly, just stating my uh, stating the importance and you know my support and solidarity for Indigenous sovereignty and decolonization struggles on the lands that I'm on and that I occupy. And that really, any conversation about bordering needs to be thinking through and alongside the ways in which settler colonialism was a regime of bordering. Right, the entire act of creating reserves and reservations and controlling the self-determination of indigenous peoples, corralling you know, indigenous peoples and nations into a, essentially a carceral system of reserves and reservation is itself a form of bordering and ordering of you know, attempted extermination and annihilation and assimilation, right? So in that sense, borders are, are not at all a tool or a praxis towards liberation, borders are inherently opposed to oppressed people's rights to self-determination and to collective liberation, right? If we think through the ways in which borders have marked and scarred indigenous peoples across these lands, including in the so-called post-colonial era of you know, the 40s, 50s, 60s and onwards. Um, and that really, I think, is the historical context, um, you know, the, the TED talk. <laughs> about why we need to abolish borders is that we cannot separate borders from empire and imperialism, right? The entire function um, and foundation of borders as we know them today come from empire, come from a history of genocide, of enslavement, of colonization, of imperialism, of capitalism, all those things made borders as we know them today. Um, and borders really don't have you know, anything to do, I shouldn't say don't have anything to do, but borders are so much more expansive than the kind of territorial demarcation of what we think of as the border, right? So in the case of the Southern US border, the US-Mexico border, it is so much more expansive than just the site of the border itself. So when President Biden, for example, says, oh, I'm no longer building Trump's wall, but I'm gonna outsource the border to Mexico, to Honduras, to Guatemala, that is also an act of bordering, right? Like outsourcing the border or in Europe, when Fortress Europe now literally extends into the entire Sahel region of Africa, extends into the Mediterranean, extends into the Middle East, into Turkey and countries in the global South are increasingly compelled to do border enforcement 
um, you know, and that is that is a pillar of imperialism, right? To, to externalize the border. So it's impossible to think about the border outside of imperialism um, in settler colonial contexts like Israel, like Canada, like the United States, you know, like Kashmir and India and so much more. Uh, the border is also a tool of expansion, of explicit expansion and conquest. Um, so I think that's one of the main reasons we really need to be thinking about abolishing the border, because the border and the ways in which the border enacts violence um, is it globalizes violence, right? It really globalizes the violence. Um, I think the second thing uh, and the second reason, if you will, that we need to abolish the border is it it um, it affixes race to the nation state. Right, like there is almost no country on this planet. I mean, I haven't, I don't know about every country on this planet, but you know, if I could make that generalization, um, that doesn't think about citizenship in racial terms, um, you know, and that's why in Border and Rule, I really wanted to try to look at as many geographies as possible because oftentimes we think of, you know, say the United States as more white supremacist, but you know, really it's a system of ordering where fundamentally you know, how long you're going to live, what you have access to in an era right now of vaccine apartheid, where where you live and what passport you hold will determine whether you are vaccinated or not, is completely contingent on this arbitrary, but, you know, arbitrary, but clearly designed system of citizenship. And really, if we think about it, you know, the continuing system of the so-called global north and the so-called global south I mean, we know that the South exists in the North and the North exists in the South, of course, so I'm not, you know, homogenizing. But if we were to think about, you know, the continued existence of the global North and the global South, really one of the key conditions that allows the North to continue to exist in relationship to the global South is the border. It is the continued containment and apartheid system of citizenship that denies, it's not the only one, but it is one of the main ways in which humanity and dignity is denied to people in the global south. Um, the last thing, if I may, there's so much more, but the last thing, if I may, is really the connection of the border to, to racial capitalism, right? So, um, you know, sometimes in some parts of, of the left, um, we are told or, you know, we are led to believe that the border will act against globalized capital, right? So some major trade unions, for example, say we need to shut down the border to quote unquote foreign workers because, you know, capital is globalized and we need to shut down the border to, to foreign quote unquote foreign workers. But I think we really have to understand is that the border acts in the interests of capital because in order for there to be a free flow of capital, there has to be immobilized precarious work, right? And we know that the United States, countries like the United States could deport all undocumented people if it really wanted to. You know, it is like the largest purveyor of violence in the world. It has the military might, the surveillance, the police backing, the immigration enforcement, if it wanted to. But the reason it doesn't is because the border acts to create the condition of deportability, which is to say that you could be deported, right? And we know that capital requires that kind of segmentation of labor to keep labor precarious, to make quote unquote cheapened labor, not cheap labor. There's no such thing as cheap labor. Labor is made cheap by, by creating precarity and manufactured vulnerability. And the border is one of the key ways in which that works, right? Like the state and capital work in tandem, not only to union bust, but to also then deport people. So the, the border works in the interests of capital to create deportability. So if we really wanted you know, um, true liberation, if we wanted true equity, if we were really fighting for workers' rights, we would organize in such a way that the border was obsolete so that working conditions are lifted for all workers, right? So I think those are just some of the reasons um, that we really need to be abolishing borders because it does nothing other than serve the interests of state, imperial, and capital violence. Wow. Okay. We are, we are off to a wonderful start. And I'll, I'll just say to our folks, who are tuning in on Zoom? If you're if you're like me, your brain is already buzzing um, with thoughts and questions. And go ahead. We, there is this Q and A function on Zoom. So if you've got questions, go ahead and drop them in the Q the Q and A uh, box there, and we can get to them later. Um, and wow, um, I so appreciate uh, you know what you've laid out here. And you know, again, 
we want to get to the kind of resistance in the present and in the future, but like, let's stick for a minute with how you are defining borders because it is so, um, it's so important and so much more comprehensive and so much more than what we usually hear about. And because I think that the, the this notion of the border, not only as a, a kind of particular as, as solely a particular location like the US-Mexico border, but also these kind of, this fixed immovable object, you know, the border as this frame <laughs> around which life happens or maybe screening, you know, who goes in and out, but that the border itself um, is just sort of present. And your description of the border is a much more animated notion of the border um, a border that is actually an offensive instrument um, that projects power, right? Which is why you use the term border imperialism. Um, and that, that, that follows people. Um, you know, I think about uh, Alison Mounts, a uh, geographer who uses the term haunting to describe the border, the, 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 the border haunts uh, people. It, it, follows, it follows them in that way. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a very different, um, a very different notion of, of borders. And I, I also want to, um, highlight as part of that, as part of this description, the, the border, not, not just the border as a noun, but bordering as a verb, you know, an, mm -hmm. an act I think is so useful. That's such an important thing. And, and, and the border as something, not only just that was bordered once, but as that is, reiterated. Yeah. yeah. Could you say more about that? Yeah, absolutely. And I don't think I could say it as well as you did. <laughs> um, so I'll riff off of what you're saying. Um, but perhaps a few things, you know, one is precisely that, like, I don't actually think the border has as much to do with movement as we think it does, right? Like when we think of the border, we think about who's moving and under, and you know, who's moving how, and this idea of migrant exclusion, which of course is a central piece to the border. Um, but really, I think it's important to think about the border and functions of migration, if you will, as really rooted in power, right? Like system, the border is rooted in systems of power. And if we rethink of migration as displacement, you know, where does that move us to? How do we understand global, global systems of power and global systems of displacement? If we think about migration more in terms of, you know, again, less in terms of movement and more in terms of who's moving under what conditions, and that also opens up a whole series of questions, right? Because on the one hand, we're constantly told we have a migration crisis, which is real. People are immobilized, people are displaced, people are contained, people can't enter the border, people are dying you know, because of border killings, because of controls on their movement. Yet at the same time, we live in a world where mobility is at its peak in ways that we've never experienced before, right? Like so many people who represent the 1%, who have class mobility, who have proximity to whiteness, to certain um, citizenship, to class, to caste, et cetera, are actually able to move like never before, right? Like you can hop on a plane, travel business class, like literally the world is at your fingertips. Like you are Columbusing like never before. Um, and so I think it's important to understand the border um, as acting in the interests of power, right? Because we don't actually have a migration crisis for all people. Um, and, you know, that's, that's a contradiction that we often talk about, but I would say it's not a contradiction, right? That is how power works. That is how settler colonialism works, right? We have to remember that for centuries, right, like millions and millions of Europeans became settler colonists in the Oceania and the Americas as millions and millions of people face genocide, enslavement, and indentureship, that this is the historical continuity that the border represents, right? So it's not quite about movement, it's about all of these kinds of forces. And that's why I think bordering is more useful because it does illuminate, as you said, a more expansive understanding of how borders work. It means we also then understand how the border is sometimes, it, you know, it works in different ways. Like, in my view, gentrification is a form of bordering, for example, right? Where you have communities that become gated communities, people who are displaced from their neighborhoods, you know, that where movement becomes demarcated across race and class, where poverty is policed in particular ways, movement is policed in particular ways, certain people experience security and criminalization in certain ways. So we see bordering happening 
in so many different kinds of ways, right? Or again, if we're looking at things like free trade zones or export processing zones, those are sites of bordering, right? Where in Haiti, for example, the United States can set up entire industrial zones where no national labor or safety laws exist or in Bangladesh, right? So it's not, again, a coincidence um, that you know the so-called global south becomes sites of extraction and sweatshop extraction. It's because of these systems that enforce privatization, but really rely on bordering regimes to suddenly say, well, this area is suspended and labor laws no longer apply. We're gonna have a special industrial police force to police this area, right? So that's also the ways in which I think bordering happens. And like you said, the haunting, you know, and even in, in so-called Western states, once you cross the border, if you are undocumented or in any way precarious, your struggle doesn't end. Like it's as simple as that, right? Like you go into a hospital, you go to access social services, you try to enroll your kid in school, the border follows you, right? Because it can become a pipeline to deportation, let alone, of course, you know, police to prison to deportation pipeline. Um, so absolutely, the struggle is not only at the border, it's the ways in which that precarity is, is constant and again, is globalized. That is so helpful and important. Um, uh, okay, so I know there's so much more we could say about this. I'll just say, just to, to round out this question of kind of what borders are and where they come from, you know, we've already got a question in the Q&A that is, can you speak to uh, how the history of slavery has had an impact on borders? And so, and you've already, you've, you've noted, you know, um, the kind of role of borders in colonization, um, the demarcation of the land, uh, you know, as imposed on indigenous peoples and nations, right? And you've talked about the kind of role that they play in regulating labor and indentured servitude and things like that. Yeah. Um, and if you could, if you could speak to slavery in particular for for a bit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I mean, there's there's a, a lot of of different examples, but perhaps I can provide the most um, striking one, I think, particularly in the US context. I'm um, certainly not the only one. Um, and here, of course, there's so much work that black scholars have done and illuminated in terms of the continuity, again, of violence between enslavement and the border. Um, and maybe what I'll start with is actually a quote from Ronaldo Walcott and Idil Abdullahi. And you know, they write in their fantastic book that quote, movements that we now call migration are founded in anti-Blackness, taking their logic from transatlantic slavery, end quote. Um, and I think, you know, again, in, in the context of, um, of, of the United States, um, one of the more kind of concrete examples, but again, thinking through the broader logics of enslavement um, and fugitivity and more, but, you know, two years after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in the United States, so this was, you know, in 1848, the treaty was enforced. This was after the forced annexation of over 500,000 square miles of what we know of as Mexico, uh, but really, all, you know, indigenous lands, Comanche, Apache, Seri, etc. So after these nations and 425,000 square miles of territory was annexed by the United States, by the U.S., Two years later, the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act was passed. And what the, what, the, what the Fugitive Slave Act allowed for was that it allowed for slaveholders to kidnap and capture black people that they claimed had escaped. And after 1848, after the annexation, slave owners also formed militias to patrol the US-Mexico border to prevent black people from escaping to Mexico. And I think this is crucial because again, you know, a lot of times when we think about the border, only as anti-migrant exclusion, we forget this continuity and this entanglement with anti-Indigenous and anti-Black genocide. And also this particular, and you were mentioning this earlier, this particular piece about keeping people in, right? So one of the earliest function of the borders was not only to patrol against so-called undesirable Chinese migrants, for example, in the Northwest in particular, and across the, the Northwest Pacific coast of the United States and Canada, um, but some of the first militias were actually formed at the US-Mexico border to keep enslaved black people and all black people within the new borders of the United States. And so some of the earliest bordering practices at the US-Mexico border were, were completely bound up in slavery and enslavement. Um, and again, to keep enslaved black, black people in, and that's also you know th this connection to racial citizenship, um, to settler colonialism, to enslavement, um, interracial capitalism. And so we have to think about that 
um, you know, and there, there's many other examples, you know, the black codes, for example, and the specific ways in which the black codes imagined and depicted black movement as vagrancy, as alienness, right? As Fred Moten would write about it. Um, that really in many ways forms the foundation of how we think about, it's not, it's not exclusively the same, but again, it takes its logic from anti-blackness, um, how we think about alienness in the nation state, how we think about movement, how we think about vagrancy. And that of course is really what carceral systems are about, right? Is that, of, is the immobilization and the containment and fundamentally this fear of freedom of ungovernable, uncontainable movement and freedom. Um, and so in that way, I think, um, and again, as you know, black scholars and organizers have been writing about for so long, um, it's impossible to think about migration outside of the bounds of enslavement and anti-blackness. It's, it's so it's so important and it's so, um, man, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's not only important analytically, but so powerful to think about what it means that surveillance regimes like like in sort of in internal or domestic surveillance regimes in a place like you know this place called the united states um that today manifest in the form of ice you know that are all about um uh controlling people's movement within mm -hmm. the country and access to all kinds of um places and and services etc based on one's status the role that enslavement of black folks and the kind of surveillance of black folks um, and policing necessary or you know that, that was involved in maintaining slavery the kind of role that 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 um that violence has you know in what we think of as migration or immigration policing today which on one hand is is such a um you know it tells us about the kind of violence deployed against different populations and violence that is incubated against certain populations and then de deployed against other populations and so on. But with that comes, I believe, an organic basis for solidarity, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's also the case uh, that, <laughs> you know, that Black struggle, for example, has been impactful in a positive way, um, you know, for like migrants who are not Black uh, in, in, a, in yeah. the United States in, historically, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, so, that might be, you know, that that note of solidarity might get us to talking more about like, all right, let, let's get rid of these borders. <laughs> and, and first, I would love to, you know, again, I'll just give you like a huge, uh, you know, invitation. You know, when we think about, when we think about what is on the other side of, you know, our bordered world, like, mm -hmm. like the world without borders, what could that mean for humanity you know I, I just wonder if you could 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 it, it could could paint a picture for us of, of what you think of and it's one of those things when um when I think about the abolitionists who organized during the time of slavery in in the U.S. so central to that abolition was 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 a call to imagine a world that doesn't that isn't yet manifested <laughs> right so what do you a world without borders what let, let's talk about it what 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 would that mean for for people well, i don't know we'd make that together <laughs> right? Right. right um i mean i think it's just that you know it really for me when i think about it um it really is the revolutionary horizon, right? Like it's not something um, that we've witnessed, but I think it is something that we imagine and we dream of. Um, I think it is what our revolutionary imaginations are made of. Like when we think about freedom, when we think about liberation, when we think about a world without cops, without prisons, without you know imperial militaries, uh, without the gender binary, without sweatshops, like all of that is bound up essentially in notions of freedom. And abolishing borders are so fundamentally tied up in freedom, you know, not in the right wing refraction of freedom of set as settler colonialism, you know, not anti vaskers as freedom. But you know, we're talking about collective liberation as freedom rooted in community and self determination and responsibilities to each other in the earth. Um, so to me, I think of a no border politics as necessarily expansive. Um, I think it means that we really 
question the shallow politics of you know humanitarianism and multiculturalism to really dismantle the racial social organization that we live under you know it means a complete dismantling of that it means that even when we say things like oh refugees welcome or we welcome you or you're a newcomer that we would actually think about what the politics of hospitality means right who are we recognizing as strangers or others or unwelcome or welcome right even the act of welcoming presupposes um, a kind of host, the idea of who is the natural uh, or entitled host, which of course in the in settler colonial context completely erases indigenous jurisdiction, right? And it centers, you know, in US and Canada, for example, whiteness um, as being able to welcome and host, right? So I think it really means we have to dismantle that racial social organization that presupposes and predetermines who belongs where. Um, so I think, you know, that's, that's a huge part of it. Um, so it's a politics opposed to liberalism and humanitarianism in that way. I think it also means um, that a no border politics is, is more expansive than an open border politics. And I think this is important because a lot of times people um, think that, okay, well, so what if we just open the borders, right? Like, what does that mean? Does that mean everyone moves wherever they want? What does that mean? for the right to stay? What does that mean for the right to return? And I think those are not contradictions, those are corollaries, right? A no border politics means that people have the right to fight displacement because it's again, not about migration or movement, it's about displacement, right? Not being forcibly displaced from your lands, being able to return to your lands, um, being able to fight all the forces that create displacement, whether it's capitalism or conquest or climate change or all of the above and more. Um, so all of that, I think, is part of a no border politics. It's not just about opening the border. Um, it means fighting forced displacement and the root causes of it. Um, it does mean that people have the right to move in order to seek safety and dignity. Um, and I think it means that, you know, we also understand that abolishing the border means that we're also abolishing capitalism and imperialism, because that is, again, what the border upholds. So I think um, you know, if we understand that what the border does uh, is that it really to dismantle the border and imagine a no border world. For me, it means that we're, you know, refusing a border that casts racialized people as perpetual outsiders. It means that we're refusing a border that constantly erases indigenous sovereignty. It means we're refusing a border that reproduces an anti black racial order in this world. It means we're refusing a border that creates and fortifies the West against the rest. It means that we're refusing a border that deflates labor power. It means we're refusing a border, which is to say that, you know, the border is the ideological basis of all immigration policies. If we are opposed to ICE, if we're opposed to detention, if we're opposed to deportation, that, you know, the basis of that is the border and bordering regimes. Um, and it really means we have to be able to embrace that no human being is illegal. Like it is absurd that we live in a world where human beings can be considered illegal, right? And that doesn't mean just dropping the I word. It means like genuinely embracing that politics. And so I think uh, for me, that's what, you know, a no border politics is. It's so much more than an open border politics. It's really expansive about ending the mass differentiation of who has access to life and under what conditions in this world today. And that it is part of that fight, right? It is part of that broader fight. And so it's hard to say what exactly it means because it is bundled up in the revolutionary struggle. It is bundled up in collective liberation. Um, and I think that's really, for me, what, what it's about, right? It means that people have the freedom to stay, people have the freedom to move and people have the freedom to return and all of the forms of exploitation and oppression um, that make those things impossible no longer exist. Right, yeah. I mean, that's, you know, you're, you're describing borders in a way that are so foundational <laughs> to, to, you know, the kind of capitalist order. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and therefore, when you pull that thread, <laughs> then, then we're talking about the whole fabric, <laughs> oh, right? The thing, yeah. Right, and, and I think it speaks to there. There's um, there's a couple of questions in the in the Q and A that are about um, kind of what to do about contemporary politics regarding migration and the contemporary injustices that are um, deployed against migrants. You, you know, this this question, for example, of you know, do we need to add 
to add add more recourse to um, you know to international law to you know probably you know there's all kinds of of uh, protections that um, can be added and and then I, I think about um, you know I hope the the questioner will will allow me to think about like. It, you know, I'm thinking about it, it struggles um, in the US, I imagine there are parallel struggles uh, in Canada and elsewhere, where, you know, there are these statuses, for example, there's this thing called temporary protected status, which is granted to certain people um, uh, from certain places who have migrated at a certain time. Um, and, you know, that is your basis to stay in the country. And there are these fights to defend TPS or temporary protect mm -hmm. protected status. And it's like, Yes, like I, you know, I'll see you at the rally because I want to defend the right mm -hmm. of these folks to stay here. And also, you're arguing for like a deep critique um, mm -hmm. of, of, of at, at every step. It's like, why is, the, you know, why is this the basis for somebody to live, um, you know, in the way that they're currently living, or frankly, live at all? For 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 so many people, these are these are questions of of uh, of life and death. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so with that, you know, on the question of struggles, mm -hmm. I wonder if you if you can think of struggles either that are happening in the world mm -hmm. today or that have happened historically that really do inspire you that that kind of get at, you know, um, in, a, in a very deep way, mm -hmm. bordering, you know what I mean? And get at get at. Um, you know, are kind of grasping at the root uh, that, that, that we're talking about and kind of point to that path yeah. of a world without borders. Yeah, I think so. I'm, I'm constantly, <laughs> I'm, I'm easily inspired. Uh, you know, just because if, if we think about struggle, as you, as you put it, you know, it's, uh, it takes, it's a profound act to struggle um, and to be involved in resistance in any form. And so, um, I'm constantly inspired because when the, you know, the odds are so stacked against us and are so stacked against, you know, struggling people in general, um, that to fight, that to come together and organize, that to believe in the possibility, you know, never, it's never predetermined, right? The future is not predetermined. All we can do is struggle to create it. So to hold on to that, um, despite all odds, despite immense odds, is 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 always inspiring to me. Um, and when I think about um, struggles that inspire me, um, for me, it, it tends less to be on, as you pointed out, you know, what the specific campaign is, because sometimes we know the reasons people are fighting a specific campaign, because it's what's needed, it's the immediate, it's what's necessary. But those movements that who in the you know in the long game. Um, or who alongside a short-term campaign articulate a broader vision. Um, you know, and for me, that's really those that are fundamentally anti-imperialist and anti-capitalist, um, which necessarily includes, you know, analysis of, of race, gender, sexuality, transphobia, ableism, and more, but who really think through um, the politics of what it means to be in migrant justice struggles, right? Like, and, and really it boils down to, um, you know, what is a common migrant justice slogan, right? Like, we are here because you are there, which just in that, we are here because you are there, rejects and articulates so much, right? It rejects the politics of like liberalism and humanitarianism and benevolence and charity, right? But rather um, demonstrates how we're bound up in global violences, right? How in many ways, migration is a form of reparations and redistribution, right? Um, so I think about movements like that, um, you know, uh, the Yellow Vests, for example, uh, in France, um, uh, uh, one of the largest undocumented um, organizations and networks of undocumented people in France and what predated them was the Sans Papier movement. Um, the Sans Papier movement made up of largely people from North Africa and the Middle East, same, the Yellow Vests overwhelmingly from North and West Africa. And they very clearly articulate a connection between French empire, French imperialism, historic and ongoing, and the conditions of undocumented, predominantly African people in France. Um, you know, and that is deeply inspiring as well as the direct actions and mobilizations and the very clear articulation, you know, even when they're fighting a specific campaign, it's always connected to this broader 
analysis, right? And it doesn't divide between, which I think is crucial, doesn't make distinctions between so-called good and so-called bad immigrants or so-called deserving and undeserving immigrants. And in that vein, you know, I think, or, you know, movements like no human being is illegal, no one is illegal, that again, even in that articulation, refuse the distinctions between who gets to stay and who doesn't, right? Whatever those hierarchies are that get reproduced. Um, you know, and in the United States, Mijente, Baji, you know, so many of these incredible organizations that are constantly articulating root causes, who are aligning with indigenous sovereignty, who are aligned with abolitionist struggles, um, who refuse to just, you know, fundamentally refuse to throw our people under the bus, right? Like we understand our people um, as everybody. So to me, these, these struggles are deeply inspiring, you know, across Europe, um, undocumented migrants who are constantly, constantly, literally facing down border controls in fortress Europe. Um, who, you know, despite being literally beat up um, on, on an almost everyday basis, facing pushbacks, um, who are still, um, you know, who are still crossing the border, right? Bosa, Bosa, the call for freedom um, in Spain, right? That is like when undocumented people cross the fence. Um, again, it's, you know, it's not a coincidence that Bosa is what is um, screamed out, right? Because again, that is what freedom means, right? The barbed wire that inhibits freedom is so central to the cause for liberation. So all of that and, and more inspires me. And I think there is so much going on in Australia for decades, people were physically breaking out of detention centers. Uh, the Woomera breakout was one of the most, um, you know, that, that video, I don't know if people have seen it, watch it. You will just watch it on repeat and be inspired on a shitty day. Um, but, you know, undocumented people, many under the age of 18, physically breaking out of detention centers with the help of people on the outside, right? So also the ways in which we build solidarity, the ways in which we see our struggles as interconnected, the ways in which we understand freedom. Um, you know, all of that is, is, is so inspiring. I don't know if that's just like a laundry list of, of so many yeah. things, but I got a lot. <laughs> no, it's, it's so, and I think it's so important, especially in a time when, you know, it really, um, it, it it's like the border kind of reigns supreme and so it's in so many ways like these examples are so they're so powerful and i think particularly um particularly the the kind of possibilities that they represent and so like as you were talking about about solidarity among folks migrating and solidarity with folks migrating i was thinking about um this moment in 2015, where many hundreds of thousands of people migrating from Asia and Africa were, were, were sought entry into Europe. Um, you know, like tons of people displaced uh, throughout Africa for economic and ecological and political reasons, mm -hmm. tons of folks displaced from, from West Asia, particularly Syria um, in that moment, folks from Afghanistan and, um, and folks, uh, arriving in particular at Greece, um, you know, and via Greece, and entering um, Europe and and getting in, like, you know, the solidarity among those folks, first and foremost, was so powerful and so effective. I, you know, I remember watching this video of um, uh, actually, you know, this was this was folks had had made it to Austria had walked, mm -hmm. you know, from Greece to Austria after having traveled, you know, to Greece. Um, and there were folks who, and, and at this point, there were folks across Europe who were trying to help and, and working to embrace, you know, this, this arrival. And I remember seeing folks, you know, Austrian folks driving to these lines of migrants walking. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there were certain folks who were particularly vulnerable, you know, people carrying small children, um, people who were walking on crutches and so on. And these drivers saying, here, come on in, I'll give you a ride. And folks saying, no, I'm staying with them yeah. because we all get in or yeah, none of us get in. and that just not as a matter of like principle, but like actually true, like folks got in because they stuck together. And, and then seeing folks across Europe, you know, in the train stations in Munich, mm 
and elsewhere, gathering with clothes, with food, with candy, applauding folks getting off the trains. There's this story of Austrian railway workers transporting migrants for free across the country. You know, as governments were say, as Iceland said, you know, we can accept like 10 people or something ridiculous like that. Thousands of Icelandic folks saying, I will personally accept folks to live in our house and, and so on. And, you know, what's what's really difficult, of course, is that after that, it was a bit of a turning point where the states of Europe built all of these barriers. Mm -hmm. But I, I just think about that moment um, and and what it represents where solidarity broke through um, as extremely important, you know. Yeah. I think so. And especially because, um, you know, holding that alongside how the stakes are often incredibly high when we think about the criminalization of solidarity, right? Like, you yeah. know, some of the trials in the United States of people who support migrants, um, you know, the trials in, in Europe of, um, folk, you know, captains of boats who have uh, rescued people um, and then been charged by their respective, you know, state governments. Um, and there's a number of high profile, you know, trials in all cases, you know, in the United States and across Europe. And I think, you know, the criminalization of solidarity is always um, such a potent way to break solidarity, right? And when people defy that, um, not only is a gesture of, like you said, you know, welcoming people at train stations, but really saying, no, like we're going to actively fight our government um, in order to stand alongside and take on these immense risks, like in Europe right now the vast majority of charges for trafficking and smuggling, even though the narrative is, you know, quote unquote, organized criminal networks, blah, blah, blah. The vast majority of people who are being charged in Europe for smuggling and trafficking are people involved in solidarity movements. Like the stakes are quite incredible. Um, and, you know, again, yet people are, are taking this on. So I think, you know, that is inspiring when we keep in mind that people are facing serious time for doing so. That is so, um, I'm so glad that you lifted that up. Um, and I'm just thinking about, you know, struggles and organizations that are doing that kind of work and facing um, great penalties for that. I want to shout out No More Deaths, um, mm -hmm. you know, um, on the, in, in, in Arizona um, and Border Angels in Southern California. Um, and, you know, if we want to shout out other, other, other folks that are, that have, yeah. are facing real severe penalties precisely for what you're saying, kind of solidarity. Um, it really, it's so appalling. And also I think we should take it as um, an indication of how powerful solidarity is, that Absolutely. it is a target you know, of the state. You know, so here's, there's a question here that um, I think uh, is, is along the lines of what we're talking about. And it is, it is about displacement um, mm -hmm. via climate change. Um, and I just want to read it. Uh, given that borders are at the nexus of many struggles, I wonder if each of you have thoughts about how growing awareness of the plights of folks displaced by climate change might invite more people into struggles around migration at large and inspire a broader reimagination of how we reorganize society. <laughs> Great question. You know, yeah, I wonder. Um, well, well, let me let me read this this other piece too because this is important. I think narratives and struggles around climate migration can fall into traps mm -hmm. of deservedness at their worst. But mm -hmm. those of us who are vigilant to this can help prevent that. Um, really appreciate that. So yeah, thoughts on climate displacement and implications um, mm -hmm. for the struggles against borders and, and for free migration. Yeah, thank you for, for bringing that up. Um, it's so critical. And you know, in, in the world right now, it's estimated for what it's worth. Um, I know stats can be weird, but uh, that climate induced displacements um, are, are outpacing uh, other forms of displacements by a ratio of two to one. And in some cases, you know, by some estimates, a ratio of three to one. So there's no uh, pretending that that's not happening, right? Like, and we know that particularly for coastal communities, low lying communities, island communities, rural peasant indigenous communities, like those are those communities are the most impacted. And of course, have contributed the least to climate change. Um, so you know, in, in remembering that, um, I think a few things. One is that I think it can be tricky that there is this new frame of climate displacement because we know that climate change is in itself a function of capitalism and colonialism, right? Like in many ways, it's a symptom, but it's almost become its own kind of thing. So there can be some articulations of climate displacement that ignore these root causes, right? That again, those communities who are most impacted are, you know, those are the fault lines of existing power relationship. So I think um, 
it's useful to talk about climate displacement, um, particularly when it's anchored, if I may, to all the other forms of oppression, right? Like not as its own kind of thing, which of course the UN and mainstream green orgs do. Um, but that being said, I think it is crucial. It's crucial, right? Because climate justice is migrant justice. Climate justice is racial justice. Climate justice is indigenous sovereignty. Climate justice is anti-imperialism. We know the United States military is the single largest institutional consumer of hydrocarbons on this planet. Um, and so, you know, all of those are connected. I think it is really useful to think about it. And I think it's particularly useful to think about it because increasingly the discourse of climate security um, and, you know, there was a story in the New York Times recently about how U.S. officials, but not limited to the U.S., you can let's see parallels all around the world, are increasingly treating climate change as a national security disaster, right? So again, not only refusing to take action on climate change, refusing to address the root causes of climate change, but now treating it as um, a reason to fortify the border more. Um, and we're seeing that around the world. So I think it is so important um, to think about climate change um, in relationship to migration, not only because of the reality of climate displacement, but also because I think it'll become an increasing pillar, um, both in kind of far right eco fascist discourses and also in national state discourses of security that will basically further securitize the border right so that makes it even more necessary to think through. Um, climate displacement and again to re-articulate re the idea of like people have the right to fight this displacement people have the right to their island um, people have the right to move in light of this massive you know apocalyptic present and people have the right to return into climate debt and climate reparations that's so right on and um you know i yeah there, there's so much there's so much to say um uh, about the question of climate justice and migrant justice and all the other interlocking justices that you named. And I want to, so I, I so appreciate that question. And I also want to um, maybe invert the question because the, the person who asked, asked, you know, can climate justice or, or the, you know, this, the, the movement for climate justice bring people into the movement for migrant justice, which I think is, is, is you know, those, those linkages are so organic. And so it's like, yes. And also, you know, I I hope that the movement for migrant justice becomes or is ever more a kind of context for folks to see, you know, join other struggles for justice too. And in particular, I just want to lift up the struggle for Palestine. Mm -hmm. um, uh, again, you know, and like when we talk about the displacement crisis that's facing, you know, millions and millions of people all around the world, um, and uh, you know the kind of bordering that is happening as part of both in response to and in driving that displacement um, that you're describing, which is which is on the rise. Unfortunately, I just think that what Israel has done has been such a service to the states of the world. They're saying, "You want to know how to control the movement of people?" You know, we have made Palestine a kind of incubator for all kind of technologies. Uh, you know, and logics and ideologies of who deserves to be where and so on. And, and then literal physical technology, um, you know, on borders all around the world. And yeah. so my hope is that, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's so important that, that folks are, um, are concerned and engaging with the question of refugees. And I wanna say, if you wanna talk about refugees, we have to talk about Palestine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not only because Israel has played such a role in terms of um, producing, you know, a refugee po population in the form of Palestinians, Israel has played such a role in the service of states around the world in terms of controlling the movement of people, but also Palestinians have developed all kinds of politics and resistances to confront uh, those things too. And the, the, this point about the right to return, to right to, right to return to places that folks are being displaced from via climate change and in other ways, Palestine, the Palestinian freedom struggle, of course, um, so so lifts that up. And the keys. And the keys, yeah. The key is, you know, the symbol, um, you know, has for so long been the symbol of, uh, of, of, you know, the Palestinian right to return because folks, when they were displaced from their homes um, in, in 1948 in particular, you know, before and since, uh, but in 1948 in particular, held onto their keys um, with the uh, vision of returning home uh, to, to their homes.
Um, we're kind of nearing uh, the end of our of our of this particular uh, time together in this conversation. And I wonder if there are any um, just last thoughts that you want to um, offer, you know, when we're talking about dismantling borders and, you know, fighting for rolled without borders. Um, and I'll just, I'll, I'll say uh, before, before you, before, you know, uh, giving you the, the last word, uh, just such gratitude to the folks who have joined us in this conversation, such gratitude to my coworkers at the Institute for Policy Studies, um, including my coworker who's working behind the scenes and making sure that this tech is running smoothly and beautifully. Um, and uh, yeah, such gratitude to you, Harsha. Um, so yeah, any, any final thoughts that you wanna leave us with? Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Um, I, I don't know if it's a final thought, um, but, I think of this often, so I don't know if it's final as it is just omnipresent. Yeah. Um, and particularly as, as I'm hearing you talk about, you know, the right of return, um, the struggle of Palestinians, and of course, many parallel struggles alongside of indigenous sovereignty for Kashmiris and so many others. Um, and the invocation of, of the key, you know, I really think about no borders as a politics of making home, right? Like, um, and I, I often, quote and think of Eduardo Galeano in an interview that he did where he said the world was born yearning to be a home for everyone you know and I, I think uh, for me it comes it really comes down to that like it comes down to homemaking as as world making and world making as homemaking and the interplay and nexus of that and you know how how the politics of no borders is nestled in the politics of home and that liberation struggle is nestled in the politics of home and you know and I don't mean that in a a purely sentimental way, but really as a pressing political issue, right? Like we're on the precipice of climate catastrophe, of mass displacement, of mass securitization as you laid out. So how do we think about home, right? Where we're all at home, where we all have a home, where we all feel at home in our bodies and our identities, um, where we have a place that we can feel at home and really that for everybody, again, also on the edge of, you know, vac not the edge, but experiencing uh, vaccine apartheid. Um, and in addition to Eduardo Galeano, you know, when he says the world was born yearning to be a home for everyone, I also think of Toni Morrison. Um, and she wrote, if I can, if I can quote her um, and end with her words, perhaps is, you know, in this new space, one can imagine safety without walls, can iterate difference that is prized but unprivileged, and can conceive of a third, if you will pardon the expression world, already made for me, both snug and wide open, with a doorway never needing to be closed home. Wow, what a um, what a beautiful and, and hopeful and um, and just powerful way to end. Um, when I think about homemaking, you know, homemaking is such important and such delicate work. Uh, so that's perfect. And thank you so much for bringing Eduardo Galliano and Tony Morrison into this conversation. And just thank you so much, Harsha. Um, thank you all for joining us. This uh, recording will be on the IPS YouTube channel, so look out for that. And uh, look out for the next conversation. Stay safe, stick together, and keep fighting. Peace, everybody.